Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Influencers Project. I'm your host, Craig Reynolds, and with me today is one of the most fascinating and neatest people that I have ever met, someone that I'm incredibly grateful for, Dr. Grant Campbell. Doctor, how are you today? I am well, Craig, and I really appreciate having me here, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You know, it's we met decades ago, and you... Um, performed the, the the procedure when McKenna and Ethan were born. And then when we were fortunate enough to have Maxwell, you were around to be the doctor for him as well. And so you were the first person to ever lay your hands on that dude. And that is so special. Like that is, because obviously you know how much I love my kids. Um, but to me, that is so special. And it was so neat to have you there and me doing it. So again, I hope you know how, how grateful I am for that. Um, and I'll forever thank you for that because that was massive. Well, it was my honor to be there. I, I've told you that many times and, and, you know, uh, it was, it was a great honor to be part of such a moment in your life. Well, thank you. Well, you know, speaking of, of lives and the way people live their lives, um, when I think of a, a life of service, I can't really think too far past for what you do. Um, as a doctor and, you know, delivering babies all day. Um, you've also been in the U S army. You've been deployed a few times as well. Um, taking care of our soldiers that are taking care of us. Um, and you also have different future aspirations that we'll get to, uh, in a little bit, but let's start off with, you know, you grew up in North Carolina and you went to UNC Charlotte, uh, Chapel Hill. And not to do it to Charlotte, UNC Chapel Hill, I'm sorry. And you moved to Charlotte in 2000 or 1997, I believe. Is that, is that what it is? Yes. And 1997. Then you, then you began your, your, your career at uh, Eastover University. Um, and that's where it all kicks off. Right. What, what was the influence behind you know, wanting to be a doctor and the path that you took to get there? Well... You know, it's interesting that I didn't really get a, a tremendous drive to go into medicine until I was already in college. You know, there's so many people that are like, I knew I wanted to be a doctor when I was four years old and I got my first Fisher Price plastic stethoscope. And and I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I was four years old, uh, my mom still talks about this in preschool when they ask us in preschool, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I was adamant that I wanted to be a garbage man. And, and the reason why was that you got to ride on the back of the truck. You didn't have to wear a seat belt. You got the, it was, it was like being a fireman. And I was just like, why would you want to be anything other than that? So, um, and there are some days I still think it would be pretty cool, but, um, so kind of to fast forward, you know, I, you know, kind of what got me towards college was I grew up, you know, rural Eastern North Carolina, very, very poor. Um, you know, my mom was pretty impressive about how she hid how poor we were at times from us. And I, I think that, you know, I was probably a teenager before I really started to kind of get a concept of, you know, what, what are we going to have to eat? Um, are, are we going to be homeless, you know, next month? You know, those kind of securities that you kind of bank on. Um, I, I started to understand that those were not givens in our life. And so I was very blessed to have a mom who I think that she saw very early on that the truest escape for poverty um, is education. And she demanded that we perform all my siblings, we, we perform to our absolute capability uh, academically. And I can remember sometimes you'd complain because they weren't happy about your grades. And she says, I'm not asking you to do anything that I know you can't do, but I expect you to do everything you can do. And I think as I got older, as a teenager, I started to realize that this is my way out of this because I wanted my only goal career rise at that point was to be in a situation where my wife and kids never had to spend time resting on their pillow wondering about homelessness or or being hungry or you know uh, having clothing or things like that 
And so I worked very hard to, to make sure I got into college. And then when I got into college, I started to kind of get interested in the healthcare field, but I was kind of more interested in the administrative side of it. Mm -hmm. And so I started kind of pursuing that. And my, my undergraduate degree was in uh, public health um, with a concentration in health policy administration. But probably one of the biggest things I learned from that is I didn't really want to do that. And I was like, well, <laughs> what am I going to do now? And, and so I, I think it was the summer before my junior year of college, I got a job as literally like a glorified orderly at an emergency room where I would mop the floors and clean the rooms, but I could watch what people did. And I had an incredible mentor uh, um, named Dr. Powell. He was an ER doctor that, that he was very inspiring to me. Um, and uh, that kind of lit that interest in medicine. What did Dr. So, Powell do that was so inspiring? Well, he... <laughs> He was just an all around amazing human being. And, I, and it wasn't it wasn't that I'm like, because at that point, I didn't really know how to recognize technical brilliance in medicine, although now I know that he was. But he was just so cool. But but he was calm, but he was such a quality human being, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I started, you know, I think my first um inspiration to go into medicine was I just kind of wanted to be like him because I just thought he was so amazing. And so, and then fast forward, someone that we share, you know, as I got into actual practice and in residency, I ran into another person like that named Dr. Ed Stubbs, um, that I had two amazing physicians that I had close contact in life that developed very deep friendships with that kind of helped me set the standard of what I wanted to be and how to carry myself. So I scrambled to get all of my pre-medical classes in and take the MCAT and was lucky enough to get into medical school. And um, then in my third year in my clinicals, I, I scheduled obstetrics as my first rotation to get it out of the way because I was like, I'm going to hate this. Let me just pinch my nose and swallow this medicine. I'll be done with it. And I remember <laughs> two weeks into it, I was like, this is totally my jam. I love really? this and I want to do it. And called my mom who had been a, she worked the front desk of our hometown OB doctor for over a quarter of a century and said, you're not going to believe this, but I think I'm going to do OB. Really? And she said, well, I always thought you'd be good at that. And I thought, and I said, well, why did you say, why would you say that? I mean, was there some skills with my hands or, or intellect that she recognized? She goes, no, even as a child, you never slept. So I just thought this would be a good career for you. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I was destined from the beginning because I was a, you know, a, a hyperactive insomniac, even as a child. Right. Maybe that's where Max is going because that dude doesn't sleep either. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, I don't know. Um, yeah. So while you started into that as a career, at what point did you, or had you already been in the Army Reserves? No, um, I gave strong consideration to joining the Marine Corps right out of mm. high school. Okay. Um, mainly because you talk about people that influence your life. My paternal grandfather was kind of my everything. He was my hero. I, I saw him as godlike um, my whole life, um, even well into my adult life. He was in, you know, he was a 30 year Marine. Um, he served in World War II. He then went into the reserves after that and got called back to serve in Korea. He was a fighter pilot. Um, and so um, by the time I was born, I didn't, he was really his military career was kind of over. Um, but I think the qualities in him of, you know, compassion and valuing serving other people and, and being an upstanding human being, I just kind of everything about him, I thought if I'm anything like him, I'll be good. But interestingly, he was the one that said, absolutely not, you're not joining the Marine Corps right out of high school. And, really? and I didn't get that. And, and he said, listen, you're going to go to college. 
And he said, and after college, if you want to go in the military, you go in as an officer, but you've already got your college degree. And, and of course, if he said, that's what I should do, I was like, well, then that's what I, that's what I'm going to do because he is, he is everything to me. So, so then got into college and got interested in medicine and, um, then after medical school and residency, and then I was married and started a family and kind of life happens. Yeah. And so I think the pivot that kind of pulled me back to the military was 9-11. And okay. so, you know, I was already in private practice at the time um, and 9-11 happened. And, you know, over the next year or two, you know, they started talking about how desperate they were for physicians with surgical experience. And so kind of 2002, 2003, I mentioned to my wife, I was like, you know, I, I think I should join the reserves. You know, they, they need me. And, and, and I think that's the best way I could help at this point. And, and I can remember my wife's initial reaction was, are you on drugs? Um, <laughs> because we have, we have a three-year-old daughter, um, you're just in private practice. And uh, by the way, we're expecting our second child. And surprise, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, fair points all around. I said, you know, I have to give you that. And, and so she kind of made a deal with me is that she said, listen, when our youngest um, is in kindergarten, if you still want to do this, then do it. And so my son started kindergarten uh, in August of 2008, and about six weeks later, I was sworn into the reserves. Um, had to join the Army because uh, you can't be a physician in the Marines. Wow, really? The, no, the Navy handles all medical for the Marines, and if you, if you grew up in a Marine family, you just don't join the Navy. That's just not allowed. <laughs> So I remember when I when I joined the reserves, I told my grandmother, my, my paternal grandfather's uh, 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 wife, uh, um, he had passed away by this point. I told her I joined the reserves and I was going to be in the Army Reserves. And and she said, well, I think that's great, my dear. And she goes, but I have to ask you, why? Why are you in the Army? And I said, well, I said, um, you can't be a physician in the Marines. So if I didn't do this, I was going to have to join the Navy. And she goes, oh, well, then that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um so when you're in the the reserves if you're of any surgical specialty if you're general surgery if you're pediatric surgery urology OBGYN, if you're any type of um, surgical specialty if you get deployed into a combat theater you're usually going to get deployed as a, either a general surgeon or a trauma surgeon and so so i knew and i knew that the shortages i knew that you know um if you go in, you're going to go. And I was like, well, look, if I'm in, if I can help, that's what I want to do. So right. um, short order after that, I was packing my bags. What was that like when you first got those, those papers and you're like, whoa, we got to go because you went yeah. where'd you go? You went to Iraq first in 2010. Right. 2010. Um, I kind of bounced back and forth between Kuwait and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was uh, deployed as a field surgeon for that. And, you know, luckily we had a little bit of time to prepare for that. I got my orders and we had about eight months before I was actually going to leave. Wow. Okay. So that gave us a little preparation time in terms of, uh, you know, getting the family ready, getting things acclimated, kind of adjusting to the new financial reality that would happen. Um, but no, I remember when I left, I remember when I got on the plane, I, it was, it is devastating to see your kids that upset to see you go. And, and at that time, let's see, Nathan was six and Maya was 10. So they didn't really get a full grasp of why that was happening. They just knew dad was going away and was going to be gone for several months. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, once you get there and you're kind of focused on what you're there to do, it was incredibly gratifying. Um, you make friends that you will keep for the rest of your life, that they live all over the country, that some of them I talk to every week to this day. And so um, it's a very different type of medicine, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. You had to make quick decisions that had... Uh, big time implications of what could turn out. There was sure. the aspect of the danger part of it. 
Um, I'm not saying that you enjoy that, but it kind of really keeps you focused on what you're there for. So um, that and the two tours in Afghanistan were three of the greatest, you know, influential moments of my life. Have you found that when you're back delivering babies, there's more of a calm because man, I don't have bullets flying over my head now. Um, obviously equally it's important, right? There's no joke. There's, there's, there's right. it's, it's the most nervous I've ever been in my life is when you were pulling Mac out and I had nothing to do with it. Um, but <laughs> well, you kind of had something to do with it. You said a little let's bit, not, not much really. Let's be honest. Let's like be honest. Um, but is there, was there, is there more of a calm about you now? Um, yes. Um, I think that one of the greatest things from a medicine standpoint that practicing surgery in a combat theater does is that it gives you perspective and it gives you focus. And, you know, when you get back home, even though it's kind of a different, obviously, environment, you kind of walk into situations and, and there's not a better feeling when you're doing a job, when you can tell yourself that, you know what, no matter what happens here, I can get us out of this. We're going to be fine. Yeah. And so I think that there definitely was a, a more measure of calm with it. And I will tell you, I think it was after my second deployment, I think one of the greatest compliments that I ever got professionally from anyone was I got called over to the operating room by uh, one of my colleagues that things were just not going well. Things were kind of going sideways and, and they asked me to come over there and scrub in and see what could do, I could do. And so we get in there and we figure out the problem. We get everything fixed up and it was fine. And um, when the surgery was over, uh, my colleague looked at me and she said, I'm so glad that you were here. She said, it was very nervous. And she said, but when you walked in the room, we just kind of knew everything was going to be okay. And I will tell you that wow. I think maybe they were giving me too much credit, but that's a pretty <laughs> validating thing to hear in your profession. And I can tell you that calmness in those types of situations, I would never have that degree of calmness and assurance if I hadn't served in that capacity in the military. Right. Um, I, I have to believe that that's a, a real heart thumper when things are going crazy <laughs> and you've got to keep it under control. Right. At that time. Right. Um, so now that you're, you're back in the States, you retired as a Lieutenant Colonel and you're also, you've got some, your current causes you put down as uh, more vets in public office. Um, what is the yes. voice that you feel that we're not hearing that would be beneficial? Well, I think part of it is a mindset. And I think that some of their collective experiences are things that I think we really could use uh, in public office right now. And, and people get the obvious, they'll say, well, if you have more veterans in public office, then when decisions have to be made about sending people into harm's way, or entering into a conflict that you're going to have people with more of a perspective of what that actually means and what the cost of that mm -hmm. truly are. And, and very much so that that's, that's a very big part of it. But I think that the other things that I think are important that we need in public office is that type of service, especially service in combat, it breeds a pragmatism in people where they become focused on solving problems and it strips them of ego because in those environments you have to depend on each other 100 percent and you have to be very honest about your strengths you've got to be very honest about your weaknesses and these folks get very much of a mission focused um, where solving problems is important instead of perpetuating problems to kind of keep the public angry and upset that might help you on election day but again you're not solving any problems and then the third thing that i think is uh, a gem from military experience that we just don't talk about a lot is that when you're over there you're part of a team of people that you literally spend 24 7 with and they are of all um genders races religions backgrounds, experiences, and you learn very quickly that that does not define anyone and that those are factors that you do not use to judge people. 
And so I think you get people that have been trained to work with anyone and not really get hung up on superficial things and start judging people on things that should not merit your judgment. And so I, I will say I've, I've got a fairly poor track record of backing winning candidates so far, but that's okay. <laughs> Is that, you know, when I, when I pick people to support with time or, or financially, I'm picking people that I think would do what we just said. And a lot of them don't win because that's kind of how the system's set up right now. But again, this is a, a marathon and not a sprint. So it, it's, that's why I want to see more of those men and women uh, in office. Do you think, and since we're on the topic of it, do you think term limits would be beneficial as well? Because then you have a different perspective that rotates in and out on a more consistent basis. It's a great question. And I'll tell you for the longest time, I've been torn on that because I think the purist in me, I used to always say, you know what, I'm not a fan of that because I feel like it's kind of a cop out as a voter. And I remember I used to tell people, you know, when we get more than 30% of people actually voting in election day, then let's talk about term limits. But the, the true power in term limits lies in the voter. And that was kind of my purism, black and white view of it for a long time. But as I've kind of watched this process, I have certainly warmed to the idea <laughs> of term limits. Um, and I think part of that is that you do when you start getting involved in this process is that you see what an incredible advantage incumbency gives a candidate. Mm -hmm. That the amount of contacts and power and money and for someone that gets entrenched into that position for decades, um, the both the numerical um, and and the and the pragmatic advantage that they have is almost uh, insurmountable. Um, right. So I got to say, I'm kind of in the term limit camp now, um, <laughs> and I never thought I would say that, but I, I really do think that one from a phil philosophical standpoint, if you do something like that, you, you should say like, like in the old times that you would walk away from your life and career to serve for a certain amount of time. And then you would walk away right. and not make it a lifestyle for you or a, a vehicle for self enrichment mm -hmm. or literally for, mm -hmm. for a lot of politicians that we see now, it's just simply a, vehicle for sustainment for an incredible ego and sense of self-importance and so yeah I, i'm all those people i used to argue with 15 years ago i, I tell them now you were right and uh i am i am in your army now <laughs> you know that is the one thing that i love about reading some of your posts is that they're very they're very thought-provoking um, and they're also very, I feel like they're common sense driven, like they're thoughtful and you have such solid points, but it also sounds like it's not, you're not preaching to the people, but you're speaking with people. And I think right. that's a big thing we've lost as a society is that we can't have a conversation and disagree about something. It's either you believe me or I don't want to hear a word you have to say, which how are we supposed to learn from each other if we're not willing to listen? Now, listen, that's uh, if I could snap my fingers, if I was if I had Thanos glove and I could snap my fingers, I, it would be to kind of reprogram people um, to look at each other and say, you know, we hardly agree on anything, but I love you. And I know there's a story behind you that makes you valuable and it makes your opinion worthy of being listened to. And and look, some of that the army did for me you know, is that you are with people that you would die for without hesitation. And, you know, they would do the same for you. And some of those people, we could not have been of different political philosophies, but we did not care because our love for each other superseded those kind of differences. And, and, and I think you said it perfectly is that we don't talk with each other anymore. We talk at each other. And I think that I think part of it is a inherent laziness is that when you're debating someone, um, you know, it's hard to 
organize thoughts and support what you believe and say, here's the facts and situations that make me believe what I believe that we've gotten to a point that if you're debating with someone and you can point out that they're the devil incarnate and you make them defensive before you even get to the substance of your issue, that we have somehow made those people feel like they've won the debate. Right. And, and one, it hurts feelings. It doesn't advance discourse. And, you know, the thing that I enjoy, you know, and, and I realize there's a bit of a hypocrisy when I say this, but I say that social media, I think, has made that worse. Um, you know, I use Twitter. I, I use Facebook. I, I love social media, keeping up with people and things like that and posting my horrible dad jokes and things like that. But <laughs> I love a good dad um, joke. <laughs> But, you know, especially when it comes to discourse, I think that Twitter is the devil, you know, that we've somehow convinced ourselves that we can make a cogent argument about something with like 180 characters. Right. When really all you can do is do maybe one soundbite and then some sort of overgeneralized statement. And I just think we've gotten lazy with that. So I think it's the laziness of debate. And then I do think that for many reasons, and I think social media is one of them, we don't put emphasis on valuing each other as people and treating each other well, even when we're not facing each other. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to, you know, I'll talk, you know, me, I'm not, I don't have a problem running my mouth. Um, <laughs> But I'll talk to anyone about anything and I, and I don't, the prerequisite is not that, Hey, you better agree with me if we're going to talk about this. I see, I, I even drift towards people that I don't agree with because I might learn something. And then also I feel like maybe just bit by bit, we're setting an example where someone else is going to see that these two people don't agree on anything and they care about each other. They talk for 30 minutes and they never raise their voice and never called each other a Nazi or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And they walked away from the discussion, probably still disagreeing on things, but as the f same friends they were before they started. Right. And I think that's how, you know, we change this. I agree. I think it's, if you're true friends, you can call your friends on stuff and you're still friends. Yeah. Even if you don't, even if you don't agree all the time. Um, you also have as current cases or causes that you're going for um, speaking on survivor's guilt as well. Yeah, um, that has uh, become a kind of a personal crusade for me is that, um, you know, I had a several year battle with this. And, um, you know, I think when you go through something like that, you start, you know, especially when you find your way out of it, you kind of feel a responsibility to help other people do it too. And um, it can be paralyzing. You know, and I think that it can affect every aspect of your life. And I think the, the best way I could describe it, and it took me a long time to kind of get this kind of clarity, is that when you're in situations where people that you served with and cared about and loved very much and, and they died. And I think on top of that, especially in a role as a surgeon where you took care of people that sometimes did not survive and you kind of carry that as a personal failure, uh, even if you did everything you could do. And what can kind of infect you after that is that you find yourself in situations that give you joy or give you happiness is that you will find yourself feeling a profound guilt for feeling happy, for feeling joy. Right. Um, uh, like a debilitating guilt. Like I, I, you know, my buddy can't do this anymore or the person that I wasn't good enough to save can't do this anymore. And so why should I not be kind of sentenced to a lifetime of, of sorrow? Um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of what you do almost unconsciously is that you start to avoid situations where you could have joy and happiness because you know that that debilitating guilt will come and it's just crushing and you start to develop um, cynicism 
and you start to develop kind of a chronic anger that you don't recognize as like a self-defense mechanism that I'm just trying not to be happy because I know how horrible I'll feel about being happy. Right. And, you know, this was years and, and, and you try to put on a facade and things like that. And I, you know, I was blessed that I had two people that have known me for over a quarter century who love me enough to say, Hey, listen, we love you. We've known you forever. And this is not you. What, what can we do? How do you, how do we help you out of this? You know, how do we help you be the person that we know you are? And, 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 you know, we've known each other for a long time is that, you know, my optimism has been one of the core characteristics that I value. And so I think when that conversation happened, it was liberating because I think it showed me without a shadow of a doubt that I was not hiding this as well as I thought. Right. And, and that, so you were like, okay, the, the, the gig's up, you know, you're not fooling anybody. And you also had people in your life that cared for you enough to say, um, you might be a complete pain in my rear end right now, but I love you. And I want to help you get back to when you weren't a pain in the rear end, because I also knew <laughs> you were a lot happier then. And I'm telling you from that day forward was liberating. And, and so, and then the second step to kind of get, out of that funk was to start talking to fellow veterans, including many that I knew and had served with. And you start to realize very quickly, you're not alone. You know, I thought I grappled with the fact that maybe I was the only one dealing with this. And there was also a part of me that thought, do I even deserve to be able to feel this way? Because as a surgeon, I, you know, my job in general was safer. Um, you know, the guys that were around me had tougher jobs, harder jobs, hotter jobs, more dangerous jobs. And I thought, if I'm struggling with this at all, does this just mean I'm weak? And so I never wanted to tell them that because I thought they might say, Jesus, man, suck it up. You know, you were a, you were a surgeon. But when I started sharing this with others and they, they're like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I dealt with that every day. And this is what I did. And so, you know, as I kind of got out of that hole, I felt like I had kind of to bring up a biblical term. I had a shibboleth that I had to pay forward. And so, I, you know, now I talk about it and I, and I help others that are dealing with it to counsel them about it. Because I feel like, you know, someone took the time to help me with that. And, and the, of course, they don't want any repayment. They love you. That's what they do for you. Right. Uh, so my, exactly. Yeah. So my repayment to them is to do it for somebody else. Yeah. What good is our knowledge if we don't share it, right? Correct. Absolutely correct. Yes. Um, Dr. Campbell, it is always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, if someone wants to get a hold of you for any reason at all, whether they want to speak with some issues that they have or they want to put you on a ballot at some point because <laughs> I can see you running for all kinds of stuff and being successful. Um, you've already got my vote as it is. Um, what's the best way that someone can get a hold of you? Um, you know, honestly, I would say to find me on uh, Facebook or Twitter. You know, here I just talked about that some of the negative things of social media, but I'm on Facebook, Grant Campbell. I'm on Twitter as uh, at Dr. Grant Campbell. And look, if there's someone that's got an issue that they think I can help with, I promise I'll be there for you. And, and in terms of public office, Craig, I don't know. I don't think that there's a spot. I don't think there's a space for someone like me who tr who puts value on common sense and and solving problems. I, you know, maybe one day, but I just I don't know if there's a space for me in that right now. Well, let's hope someday soon there is because I'm I'm on that same boat with you. I think there's a, a lot to be said to run on the platform of common sense. Let's hope so one day. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Campbell. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you hopefully someday soon at school um, with all of our kids running around again. Um, I look forward to that very much. 
I do too, Craig. Give my best to, to your family. You're, you're a wonderful man, and uh, um, it's an honor to call you a friend. Well, the honor is all mine. I promise you that, but thank you. It means a lot. Um, if you guys like what you're seeing, please make sure you go ahead and subscribe here on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts. Uh, take care of yourselves. Dr. Campbell, be good, and I'll hopefully I'll see you soon.